This is unit four, chemical bonds, and we are covering intro to bonding in this first concept of notes. So before we even dive in, I want you to know that there is a very important distinction we need to make. And that's the distinction between intermolecular forces and intramolecular forces. So that prefix inter means between or among. And one way I remember this is I think of the word international. International means between different nations or different countries. Whereas intra, that prefix means within. And so I always think of intramurals, how colleges will have these intramural competitions where you play sports against different teams, but they're all students at your same school. You're not playing different schools. So the competition is within the student body at the school. So that's the difference between inter and intra. And as that relates to bonding, which is what this entire unit is about, we need to know what intermolecular forces are versus intramolecular forces. So intermolecular forces are referring to the forces between different substances, which we're going to cover entirely in concept six of this unit. And we see that here. Some of you may recognize this picture from biology. This is a sample of DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. And your DNA is a macromolecule, and it's made up of smaller subunits, which are monomers called nucleotides. And those nucleotides are made up of sugar, phosphates, and nitrogen bases. Now, you have all these different nucleotides in your DNA. The nucleotides are held together. Different nucleotides are held together by hydrogen bonds. That's an intermolecular force between these different nucleotides. That's what holds them together. Whereas forces within a substance or the intramolecular forces are chemical bonds. That's what we're really thinking here. So when we look at one individual nucleotide, like right here, it has a sugar, a phosphate, and a nitrogen base. And these solid lines that hold those together are covalent bonds. Or you can see one down here as well. So the intramolecular force is the covalent bonds that hold those atoms together. And then the intermolecular forces are what hold the different nucleotides together within this huge, larger structure. So it's really important that we know those differences. And so in this concept, we're going to really zoom in on intramolecular forces or chemical bonds. So what is a chemical bond? Most elements, which we've been learning about in our past couple of units, they're not found just by themselves in nature. Usually they are found combined with other elements. And they do that by forming chemical bonds. They form these chemical bonds in order to be stable. So a chemical bond is just a force or a mutual electrical attraction that holds atoms together in a substance. I really like to think of them as the glue that hold atoms together. And when atoms form these chemical bonds with other atoms, what's really happening is their valence electrons, which we learned a lot about in our last unit, they're basically just getting redistributed in a way that will make both atoms or however many atoms are in the compound stable. And so how this redistribution happens kind of reflects the type of bond that has formed. So the most important thing you could hear me say in these lecture notes is that bonding is a spectrum. Okay, so it's, kind of, it's more fluid than it is in these distinct categories in which I'm going to teach them to you. I'm going to teach you three types of bonds, ionic bonds, metallic bonds, and covalent bonds. But it's not that clear and not that cut and dry. It's much more of a continuous spec spectrum of attractiveness of electrons because the type of bond that forms is entirely dependent on how attractive the electrons are. So you may remember this term from unit three electrons, electronegativity. It is the measure of the ability of an atom in a bond to attract electrons. So if, if an atom has a high electronegativity, it's going to really attract those electrons. Whereas if an atom has a low electronegativity, it's not really going to pull hard on them at all. And what we can do is we can calculate the delta En, the difference in electronegativity between two different elements, and that can help us discern where on this spectrum those elements will fall and most likely predict the type of bond that would form.
So if the difference in electronegativity between two elements is less than 0.5, usually we're going to end up over here on the spectrum. It's going to be mostly a covalent bond. If the difference is zero, it's going to, we would call it a pure nonpolar covalent bond, meaning that the electrons are going to be shared perfectly evenly because both atoms are going to be pulling on them the same amount. They're attracting them the same exact amount. Now, if that delta En, the difference in electronegativity, is between 0.5 and 2, so more like around here, we're going to say that it's in that polar covalent category. So they're going to share electrons, but polar means there's going to be different poles. So one side's going to pull a little harder than the other side, even though they will still be sharing. They'll just be sharing unfairly. And then typically, if the difference in electronegativity is greater than two, we say that the bond is mostly ionic. Now, the higher we have, uh, or the greater the electronegativity difference, the more ionic a compound is. The lower the electronegativity difference, the less ionic a compound is. And so, again, it really is a spectrum. Think of it as tug or war. Ionic is basically one side pulls them so hard that the other side lets go of the rope and completely falls over and have no hold on the rope. Whereas nonpolar covalent, the other extreme is, you know, both teams on either end of the rope are pulling the exact same amount and the middle of the rope isn't moving. And then you've got polar covalent, which is somewhere in the middle. So one team is going to pull a little stronger, but they still both have hands on the rope. Okay, so it's this continuous spectrum. But again, for the sake of simplicity, we're going to teach you, you know, in kind of distinct categories, the different types of bonds. But please don't forget that this is a spectrum. That's really important. So chemical bonds are formed through chemical reactions, which from now on, we're going to be using the word reaction so much. Our entire next unit is called chemical reactions. So RXN is an abbreviation for reaction. I'm going to use a lot just to make the notes shorter. So I just want to introduce you to that here. So chemical bonds form through chemical reactions and they result in compounds. And so hopefully you might remember this term even from unit one uh, when we kind of introduced, you know, classifying matter. But a compound is when two or more elements are chemically combined. And what's so important that you understand about a compound is that the properties of a compound are very different from the properties of the elements that make up that compound. So for example, Sodium on its own and chlorine on its own are very different from sodium chloride, which is a compound table salt, which you're able to eat. Okay, so that's really important distinction to know. Now, when a chemical reaction occurs, atoms are colliding. And what happens with their valence electrons when they're colliding is kind of determining the results of the reaction and what's going to form. And typically what we see is electrons are either transferred in the formation of an ionic bond or those electrons are shared in the formation of a covalent bond. Ionic bonds make ionic compounds, covalent bonds make covalent compounds. But again, remember it's more complicated than this, but I'm just trying to simplify this for you so that you can understand it. We're going to get into these a lot more. Ionic bonds in concept two and covalent in concept four of this unit. Now, before we can, you know, talk more about compounds, you need to know what a chemical formula is. So a chemical formula is used to tell what elements and how many of each element are in a unit of a compound. So for example, NaCl, we already talked about that's sodium chloride. This is the chemical formula for NaCl. And when we don't see any numbers here in the subscripts, that tells us that there's just one. So if you don't see anything that represents a one, so sodium chloride is one atom of sodium for every one atom of chlorine. Now, sodium chloride is an ionic compound. And so in an ionic compound, which we'll learn more about later, the subscripts, the, which here is a one-to-one, -one, they're really representing the ratio of ions because what ionic compounds do is they kind of form these crystal um, lattices or lattices that... Um, have these alternating compounds that are really stuck together. So it's really representing the ratio of in this compound, we have one sodium for every one chlorine in there. And that's different from what we would see in a covalent compound like on this next slide. So another example, H2O, that's a chemical formula for water. Okay, which looks like this. We can look at it as just one individual molecule because it's a covalent compound, which again, we'll talk about a little bit later why we look at it that way. So H2O means two atoms of hydrogen, 
and one atom of oxygen. Okay, that's what we see in this picture. That's what represents water. It's a two to one ratio. That's what makes it water. If these numbers are different, it's no longer water. If it's H2O2, that's hydrogen peroxide. Okay, so the numbers really, really matter just as much as the, you know, elements, symbols matter. Another example, let's look at NH3. That is ammonia. Okay, it's one atom of nitrogen, which we see here, and three atoms of hydrogen. And then one last example, this one looks a little bit more complicated, Al2SO43, this is aluminum sulfate. Now, this one looks more complicated because this is an ionic compound, which is why you kind of see another picture of a crystal light is here, but it has something called a polyatomic ion in it, which we'll get to again later, but it's a, it's a covalently bonded group of atoms that have a charge. And so when you're interpreting a chemical formula like this, any of these numbers on the outside of the parentheses, they get distributed just like they would in math. Okay, so let's look at this. Let's break down and interpret this chemical formula. This shows us that aluminum sulfate has two atoms of aluminum, and then it also has three sulfate ions, which we'll learn about these polyatomic ions and we'll learn their names. And each sulfate ion contains one sulfur atom and four oxygen atoms. Now, if I wanted to break this down though even further, I would say there's two aluminum atoms, but then that three distributes. So there are three sulfur atoms and then three times four, there are 12 oxygen atoms if I really wanna break it down all the way. And we're gonna practice doing that right now in class, just get a little bit more familiar with understanding these chemical formulas because you will see chemical formulas like this for the remainder of our school year together. So it's really important you're able to interpret and understand them. But now let's talk more about how these chemical formulas we said represent compounds. So let's talk more about how those compounds form. At this point, you've already seen some observations and made some about ionic versus covalent compounds if you were here for the lab stations where we explored compounds. And I've already told you that bonding is a spectrum. And we've already now familiarized ourselves with chemical formulas that tell us what makes up a compound. So now we really need to understand why compounds actually form in the first place. And we're gonna talk about the ways that atoms accomplish these goals in forming compounds. So why do they form compounds? To be stable. All elements want to be stable and most are more stable when they're in a compound than when they're on their own. And what stability really means is usually we're shooting for the octet rule, which means that atoms will gain, lose, or share electrons in order to have eight in their outer energy shell. Now, there are exceptions to the octet rule. Um, you may remember hydrogen and helium, they only have room for two valence electrons um, in their outermost energy level. But there are also some compounds that end up holding more. There's BF3, PCL5, SF6. We're going to see some more later and you're going to be like, uh, what? That's way more than eight. But in general, we're shooting for eight. Stability really doesn't just mean eight though. Stability just means full and complete outer energy level of valence E. And again, for most though, that means the number eight. So let's see a visual of how a bond like this would form. You remember Bohr models, hopefully, that we can use as kind of just like a two-dimensional, really simple drawing of an atom structure. So here we have sodium, which has 11 protons and typically 12 neutrons in its nucleus. And then we have chlorine, which has 17 protons and typically 18 neutrons in its nucleus. Now look at the outermost energy level of sodium. It only has one valence electron, whereas chlorine has seven. Remember, we want the outermost energy level to be full. So for sodium, it could gain seven or it could just lose one. And then this becomes its outermost energy level, which is already full. Chlorine could gain one and all of a sudden be stable, or it could lose seven. So they're gonna typically do what's gonna be the easiest for them in order to form a bond. So sodium has that one valency, we can see it right there. It makes the most sense for sodium just to lose that one electron in its outermost energy level so that then it's full in the outermost because this becomes the outermost and thus it'll be stable. Chlorine though has seven valence electrons. So it makes the most sense for it to just gain one in its outermost energy level so that it'll be full and stable. So what we see with sodium chloride is sodium transfers this one electron over to chlorine. And when it does that, it forms an ionic bond and it makes sodium chloride or table salt or NaCl.
Now, would elements ever not benefit from doing this? Yes, of course. And that's if they're already stable. And that's what we see in the noble gases. They don't do this because they're already stable. That's why we say that noble gases are non-reactive. Because remember, chemical bonds form during chemical reactions. So we say noble gases are non-reactive because they don't really want to do chemical reactions because they're already stable. They don't need to do that. They're stable, again, because their outermost energy levels are already full. Remember helium and neon and argon, and we could keep going on and on down the periodic table in that group 18, and we would see the same thing. Okay, now, since this is an introduction to bonds, I'm going to give you just a brief overview of the two main categories of bonds we'll be talking about, covalent and ionic. And I'm going to give you some information on slides, but I want you to fill it into the table that's in your notes. And again, I just want to emphasize that bonding is a spectrum. I'm going to simplify it for your sake so it's easier to understand. But just remember, really the best way to look at it is on the scale of like things on this end are mostly ionic. Things on this end are not ionic at all and they're mostly covalent and it goes back and forth. Okay, so first let's talk about covalent compounds, which results when covalent bonds are formed. So the covalent bond is the bond that results between non-metallic elements, so non-metals, that are going to share electrons and they're going to form a molecule. And a molecule is just a compound formed when two or more elements are covalently bonded to each other. And like I said earlier, when we were looking at the chemical formulas, we can look at a covalent compound as just like one individual molecule, like one unit of water or one unit of ammonia, but that's not really how we can look at ionic compounds since they form that um, lattice structure. And molecules, again, they're, they're neutral overall and they're sharing. So I love these two pictures that kind of show what happens here in H2O. We have two hydrogens, one oxygen, and notice how they share two electrons here and they share two electrons here. And I love how the overlapping circles really show this visual. And then again, look here at nitrogen with the three hydrogens. It has three unpaired electrons and those share with each of hydrogens. And now look, if you look at this circle in the center around nitrogen, it has eight to, access to eight. And if you look at just each hydrogen, they each have two, which is what they need to be stable. And so that's why they share because they're better together than they are apart. Now, because of this structure, what we're gonna see over and over again, just like we see in life science, is that form dictates function. So the shape or the structure of something is going to determine how something behaves or acts. And so covalent compounds, which have these covalent bonds in their structure, have really specific properties that we tend to see. So again, first is that covalent compounds are made of nonmetals that are sharing electrons. And we typically see that at room temperature, they could be solid, liquid, or gas. So they could be really any state of matter. We also see that they tend to have low melting and boiling points, which means it doesn't take as much energy to change their state of matter. Another thing we see is that we cannot conduct electricity if we dissolve them in water. So if you dissolve sugar in water and then you try to conduct electricity through it, it will not work. Now, this is different from what we see in ionic bonds. So ionic bonds are when atoms transfer electrons in order to be stable. And we typically see this between a metal and a nonmetal. Although we'll see later when we learn about polyatomic ions that really is just between charged atoms. So when only made from one kind of metal and one kind of nonmetal, we call it a binary ionic compound. It's just like NaCl, one metal, Na, one nonmetal, chlorine. We can refer to it as a salt. And not so NaCl is table salt, but there's lots of other salts too besides that one. MgCl2 is also a salt. And again, ionic bonds result in the formation of ions within an ionic compound. And ionic compounds have their own unique properties. So they're that crystalline solid, like I've showed you here before. They form a crystal lattice a network of the cations with the positive charge and the anions with the negative charge that are mutually attracted to one another. Because remember, opposites attract. So that's why they form this rigid structure. This structure makes ionic compounds very strong. And so that's why they have higher melting and boiling points because they're held together more tightly than covalent bonds are. Another unique thing about ionic compounds is when we dissolve them in water and the ions dissociate and separate, you now have all these things that hold a charge and we're able then to conduct electricity through it, which is pretty cool.
All right, that is it for now. We're gonna practice distinguishing between ionic and covalent compounds, and then in our next concept, we'll move on to diving deeper into ionic.